And we're recording. So welcome to Database Office Hours. Um, it's great to see you. And um, we have a lot of topics on the agenda. That's great too. Um, I don't know if Victor is on a call. Um, all right, he commented he's absent, absent today. Um, so he, he couldn't join. Um, it is still sort of an interesting topic because he was pointing out that um, we have this usage ping database queries and they basically try to count all the stuff. And that's increasingly hard when you when you have like big tables. And, and for some of those, we already use um, approximate counting. Um, and for others, we still count exactly. Um, and there is a proposal for like efficient or transactional counters. Um, but it's still in the backlog, so I'm, I'm not sure when we are going to see that happen. Um, I created an, another issue that is for uh, batched counting, um, and it's very fresh. I don't know. Um, I would love to get comments on that, um, if that makes sense. But given that the usage ping is sort of a background job, um, we can take a lot of time for counting that doesn't hurt. It just hurts when you when you take ages for one query. And if we would instead just uh, batch count, um, you know, count single batches of 10,000 records or so, um, it would take a long time, but it would actually finish um, because we wouldn't run into a statement timeout. Would that make sense? Should be also very simple to implement, I guess. All right, should we move on to um, merge requests, Mara? Yes, so after reviewing some merge requests, I have some questions. Um, so I have a question regarding the migrations that are located on their post-migrate folder and the migrations that are located on the, the migrate folder. Like if we have a background migration, where should we go? Do we have like a strict guideline regarding those or it does, it, does it matter? My impression is that we, we usually put them to post-migrate um, because they, you know, they run in the background, so they would, they would run anyways when, when the new code is deployed, and that's probably what you want, right? When you kick them off in a, in a um, regular migration, that happens before the code is exchanged, so that would, that would actually sort of try to run a job that um, may only become present on the code base when, when the deployment finished. So I um, tend to think that's maybe the reason why we put most of them in the post-migrate, if that makes sense. Should we enforce that when reviewing? Like, hey, you have a background migration that is on the migrate folder, but it should be on the post-migrate folder. Have you seen instances of that? Yes, yes, that is what uh, is making me ask that this because I'm not sure how to react. Uh-huh. Um, could you could you paste an example for that? Um, just be interested in how that looks uh, like. Yeah, I can do that. Let me try to find it quickly. Thanks. And I can't really think of a reason why we would want to kick off a background migration before we update the code um, or if there was any difference really other than that. Well, I, I do have a, an example of that, but I did post it in the post migration because it just felt like obvious for me that a data migration should go into a post migrate kind of more of a uh, like, I don't know, logically, but like we deployed a fix and then in the next deploy, we would do a data migration. So that would kind of, you, you can think that the code is already there. So in the next deploy, you can kind of put it into, into the migrate folder because it's going to just um, enqueue certain jobs. So it's going to be fast and the code is already there. So it, it, like there is no 
reason to have it like a, a longer post migration or something like that. So yeah. that might be one of the reasons, but I don't know uh, what the exact reason is. On the other end, in that case, it wouldn't. It would also be totally possible to do that in a post migrate, right? Oh, yeah, it would, yeah, it yeah, wouldn't make yeah. any difference. Basically. It's just like right now, as I see it, it doesn't make any difference where you put it, other than just logically separating the fact that this is a kind of a data migration more than a, uh, a schema migration that needs to happen um, before um, before the, the code actually changes. Mm -hmm. What we sometimes do is when, when we do those um, batch uh, background migrations where we update records in a batch fashion um, is we basically have a post migrate or you know a regular migration where we um, sort of build up the batches so that we iterate all the batches that we have, um, and then we schedule jobs for, for each of those. Um, probably doesn't take a long time, but um, that may also be something that is more heavy than, than like a, a normal DDL statement or whatever. Um, so maybe that's another reason to put it in a, these things in a, in a post migrate even. Uh, I just put an example of a background migration that is on the DB migrate folder. I couldn't find a merge request, but I found like several background migrations. You don't mind I put it on the on the dock as well. Yeah, sure. Like particularly on this case, how can we tell that it is correct to put like this migration on the on this folder? It sounds to me that there is no like strict ruling on this, but like I think ideally that any data migration should go to a, to a post migrate. It sounds like so anything that is schema related that that, that obviously does need to happen before uh, code can actually start working with that data should go into the migrate folder, and then pretty much everything else should go into post migrate. That, that sounds like logical, at least to me, but it might, might, might not even be that strict as well. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, really the only, only reason where that might not work is when, when you actually introduce the background migration or any change to the background migration um, with the same um, MR. And then you need to do that in the post migrate. But for database, I don't think it's makes much of a difference. Um, based on the these questions I, I asked, uh, the, the delivery team, um, Yorick answered um, on that one uh, whether or not it would make a difference um, putting migrations in uh, in a regular one or in a post deploy. Um, for the de deployment or if there's any preference where we should put, put them if, if there's a choice. Um, and he pointed out that um, for the deploy, it doesn't really make a difference because you would, you would have the deploy takes as long as it takes for executing those. Um, it's just the order is different. Um, and we have a sort of a rough guideline for the, the post migrate where it shouldn't take longer than, than an hour for, for the full deploy. Um, which is probably also something that is hard to tell when you when you only ship one migration, um, but sort of gives an idea. So everything that, that would take longer than an hour should not go into any of the regular migrations. I don't think we have the document uh, somewhere though. No, I'm going to add that to the guidelines so it is easier. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Sure. But also, another thing is that you can actually skip the post migrations, right? And then you cannot skip the, the migration. So this is why, like, it makes sense that some data migration should go into 
into post migrate because then you can do a deployment and do a code update with just the, 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 the normal migrations. And then you can just run the data migration whenever uh, your server feels like handling the, 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 the load. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And the other question is basically how to choose background migration or uh, regular yes. migration. Yes, uh, I, ha I have an example of this. Mm -hmm. uh, let me paste it. Uh, so I, I put the merge request on the chat. Mm -hmm. And basically this is a migration that is changing some data on the boards table but the boards table only has like 100 records uh, and they wanted to initially to do a background migration. And uh, for 100 records, I don't think that is necessary because the update query would be very, very fast. Uh, so I'm not sure when we should use background migrations like for updating records, like do we have like a certain guideline, like if the table has less than 5,000 records, maybe we could use just like a, an update query and that would be much easier to implement instead of writing background migration because then we will need to, work, to write the migration and the specs for it. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in any way, but I, like my thinking is that we may have some kind of data in our database and, and obviously GitLab Home is probably the, the biggest instance you can have but you can never know like what other customers are doing. So I think like a good rule of thumb is like to, to actually just enforce to have all of the data migrations perhaps. It doesn't take longer, I think even if it's in queued, it'll like delay what, two minutes later or something like that. Well, yeah, it depends on how, how big the queue is obviously, but like it does sound that it doesn't hurt to just enforce it, it, it will be even, I guess it will be easier to also um, have some kind of automated rulings and, and checks on that. So I'm not sure if it hurts or not. Obviously it will be faster if you put it into normal migration and not in a, in a queue, but like just for my maintenance point, it sounds like. Not, not only faster, not only faster, but less fragile because when you use uh, Redis sidekick, uh, to, for, to, to change something in Postgres, you need to keep in, in mind that uh, something can happen on Redis side or something like that. If, we, if in case of just 100 records, I would use just simple um, one batch, regular one transaction migration. But of course, we need to be sure that other installations have not more than say 1000 uh, records. Also, uh, I would, I would uh, shift uh, from uh, considering amounts of rows to uh, if, if like there is a good um, target for every batch processing time, not uh, amount of rows, but time. Uh, every user dealing with uh, website, if uh, a latency uh, reaches uh, um, one second, it's already very, very noticeable. So uh, if we update something, uh, it's better not to exceed one second. Pro uh, better, of course, less, but one second is already, like if we lock someone with our update up to one second, it's already noticeable. So I would estimate uh, when we deal with background migrations, I would estimate uh, using gitlab.com data, how much, how long is uh, one batch processing? And then I would decide. But uh, back to background migrations, this is the, the, the most, like, most fragile approach because we split two batches, we put it to Redis, then we uh, rely on consumers and so on. Uh, there are many moving parts here uh, compared to simple, simple uh, migration with Ruby on Rails and that's it, right? Yeah. Um I remember an example where uh, we were actually shipping another round of the same migration, but not in a background migration, but in a regular one. 
to make sure that all those batches actually executed so there's no data left to update. So um, that was a bit odd too, because you would do the same thing all over again to make sure that you know you caught everything. Um, so yeah, that that's a bit more fragile than yet other approach. And then there is um, you can always uh, also consider doing batch updates in a regular migration, right? Um, so for for the the really huge background migrations that we have, we we would we would aim for scheduling a batch every minute or so just to keep the keep the traffic on the database load spread out the load over time and also make sure that we don't lock end up locking too many records for for too long period of time um but on the other hand when you when you talk about like a few thousand rows um i don't see a big reason why why we wouldn't be able to also do batch updates in, in a post migrate for example if it's a few thousand rows and the table is very narrow, like no toast involved, it, it can be just one batch, actually, because it will be probably less than one second. Right. Do, do, you, do you think it's like it's worth defining some rules here, like thresholds to make this, like, to, to support decisions, like some numbers? When, when we prefer this or that? Yeah, totally useful, of course. Um, yeah, I think that will be very useful for reviewers because that will give us some guidelines to actually measure the tables. It's maybe interesting to come up with something that is actually applicable in the end. Um, but I, I really like the idea of, of saying like if that takes one below one second for a batch on, on GitLab.com, then should be good. That is something that, that you can measure easily. Um, you don't have to deal with the number of records because that may even be different on other installs. Now, how can we measure that it is below one second on GitLab.com? Because I'm not sure if ChatOps allow us to do that because I think ChatOps is read only and it is mostly for selects. I think we will need access to a database production replica, right? Yes, and not, not this only is to very good question. This is a very good question. I'm working right now on a new tool. You can check it right now on, uh, there's a new uh, Slack channel called Database Lab. Please welcome and see it. Uh, there are some issues. So this is like uh, data, uh, production database clone, and you can do anything you want, uh, same way as ChatOps. Uh, you can write help there, there, and you will see commands supported. So you can uh, run updates, uh, delete anything, and also cre create some indexes and so on. And then uh, this command reset, so you can revert any changes you did. But there, uh, there are two things uh, uh, to like to, to remember. F first is it's uh, right now it's single uh, node, so if two people are working simultaneously, they can probably mix some some actions, and it can affect other people. But it's like it's proof of concept right now, so early stage. Uh, and another thing, uh, this database is on ZFS. There are some issues with some tables, like uh, you you probably will see if you try, you will see uh, uh, some errors. I'm working on it. Uh, so, something is wrong, but I will fix it. Soon, I hope. But uh, exactly this, like exactly this thing, is needed to check any type of query on database clone. You will see detailed plan. Of course, timing may differ from production because this instance is smaller. But uh, um, be wrong to this direction is is okay. I mean, you, if you if you see two seconds on a production, it will be one second. It's fine. And actually, what is most important also like um, amount of memory affected. So, like. Uh, time is very volatile thing. Uh, depends on uh, at night. It, it, at, at night in Europe, it can be one second. At day in Europe, it can be several seconds on production because the server is more busy. But buffers, like it's very hard. I, I raised this question. Let's define numbers. But uh, actually, uh, like the most stable thing is number of buffers we touch, right? So, but so, but uh, we, it's hard to define. Um, rules based on those numbers. It's better to define them on seconds, but seconds are volatile. So they are like 
a lot of moving things here, but uh, I hope we will end, uh, end with um, defining some numbers. Here. So please check uh, database lab uh, channel and try it. That's really awesome uh, seeing that happening. Um, is that, since you mentioned this is only for one user currently, is there a chance well, that we uh, sort of interfere each other? Or? Yeah, so interference um, might happen easily, but you will see it because it's public channel and everybody right. sees it. In future, I hope it will be like a support of sessions and, and so on. Uh, it's still unclear how to implement it better. Uh, the main thing, uh, the main thought that uh, like dynamic provisioning uh, should be possible of um, uh, instances and reprovisioning, deprovisioning. Like if nobody uses such some instance, it should be automatically destroyed. Uh, but uh, right now, yes, it's only one single uh, disk, one single instance. Not very powerful. I think it was 16 cores. So, uh, so. Uh, um, uh, throughput is throttled, right? So up to 200 megabytes per second, I think. Mm. Uh, and uh, but anyway, it's like proof of concept. It's working, so you can go there and check uh, uh, check uh, execution plan for any update, including the, those uh, from the ground migrations. Nice. And also, yeah, also create index and see. It can be much slower, especially with creation of indexes. Uh, cache is cold there on production. Like, it depends, but on many day, many pieces, many many parts of data is is in cache, uh, and uh, so index creation on production will be much faster. Uh, mm. But at least you will see numbers of buffers uh, involved and in, in plans, and this is the most important because you understand. Okay, for to get these several rows, we we need to touch this number of buffers, each buffer is eight kilobytes. So we understand how much data we need to, to, to involve from tables and indices. So, so already something. Yeah. Right, they, what we did previously was uh, using those um, one-off instances for getting getting a full copy from production and then using that um, and then throw it away. and. That suffer from the same thing where where you you have like a different instance size, um, different resources. Yeah. But what was really helpful is when you when you have things like um, you know you you compare that to the previous version of the query. You want to optimize the query, um, or even just the same query and then creating an index for that. When you see a speed up compared to the previous version, um, that is still so relative to the the old version. Um, that is still meaningful. Um, May not be the same absolute runtime on, on production, um, but it still suggests that there's a good improvement to the query in, in any case, right? And number of buffers will be the same, actually, mm -hmm. because physically it's just, it's like a clone. Physically, the layout is the same, including bloat and everything. And uh, exactly, this this is uh, this thing is based right now on the same restore. So, How up to date will, will that be? I'm sorry. Uh, right now it's uh, like uh, four or five days old and I'm, I'm going to like soon I'm going to create uh, some approach to, to refresh it every week on, on the weekend. Yeah, I think even a monthly or even bi-monthly should be just fine, I guess, uh, like, uh, like size-wise because it, it would be different than production, but it will be very, very close to what you have on production. So. If we so what I'm what I'm trying here to say is that even if it's not uh, feasible to do it weekly, doing it monthly, where where every couple months should be uh, just fine, I guess, for the engineering team to 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 estimate stuff. Yeah, makes sense. Yes. On the other hand, when you you know when you deploy regularly, um, you might even not see all of those tables that have been introduced while while or since that that snapshot was taken. Um, so it may complicate things when you have to, you know, figure that out, what is, what is missing. And on the other hand, it may be even possible to just, um, attach that instance to, to the production archive and, and actually keep that updated, um, 
right? Uh, yeah, I thought about it in this actually. So it's like it's it's like a replica uh, consuming from archive, and when you start working with it, we we put it on pause, get a ZFS snapshot, promote it, work with it, and then revert, and it's replica again. I, I thought about it. Maybe it will be feasible. I, I'm not sure. Like, if you work with it many, many hours, it can be very, very delayed and uh, to catch up. Might, might be not enough resources to catch up. It's like it's an open question, and it's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, we could also like take snapshots from production every hour and then. Just every day, yeah, create, that's, create, that's, and create the instance, recreate the instance from that, or something like that. All right, why not? Yes, mm. I'm still, I'm still curious, uh, and what, like, uh, I want to see uh, compare performance of uh, just restored from or instance just restored from uh, this Google snapshot compared to normal instance. So it's interesting to see mm. how it will behave. I didn't do it yet. So this replica will still be read-only, right? No, no, no. Of course, no? You, you, you can you can do anything there. You can okay. even drop table, drop table. You can try to drop database, but you will not succeed because you connect it to it. But you can drop anything, and then say, then just uh, execute command reset, and uh, everything will be reverted uh, in several seconds. Okay, cool. Then I have some stuff to try it out already. Yeah, go ahead, please. And this is really the awesome benefit from that because ChatOps today is, is uh, like read only. Um, uh, whenever you want to you want to create something, um, that doesn't work. But that's really cool to have when you you create a snapshot. You just promote that. You have a read write copy. You can do whatever you want, um, and then just reset that. So it's very nice. Cool, then I guess my next question is kind of solved. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have on the agenda, which is like, how can we get some of this access where we can uh, try out stuff and then basically come up with the results, post it in the uh, MR merge request or reissue and, and get um, your review. So that should be much easier for you guys to review than uh, go ahead and do it all yourself and then for us to wait for the results. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. Please let me know if anything uh, wrong or some questions with that tool. Like, me directly or something. Sure, sure. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll um, move on and, uh, and work with some of the uh, migrations that I had been working on and, and waiting on the review. And then now I guess, I can do most of it myself. So, yep, that's awesome. Thanks. The other part of your question was how what you, what you can do to speed up the uh, um, reviews. I I just wanted to say what you put in there, like um, providing the actual SQLs, um, uh, providing the execution plans, and so that really helps to speed up things. Um, because then you only have to look at a SQL and not 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 you know check out and then figure out what the active record produces. Um, and what I found really helpful is when when you um, provide an example for the SQL before that change, um, best with an execution plan, and then the same thing after that change. So you can really spot the difference in both the um, the query and the plans. And in the best case we'd be using uh, a good example for, for parameter values. For example, when you, uh, when you do heavy query, that might, might be different for the CE, repos or CE project uh, compared to, to a smaller project. So picking good parameter values um, is also great. Um, and that really speeds up things because you, you just have to look at that and then um, that's really good. Is it, is it though okay to like, paste the entire SQL in the comment, or is it just better to link it to somewhere external? I don't know, is it like sometimes, not sometimes, like the recent Mars that I'm working on, the SQL includes a couple union statements and then it doesn't update. So it, it's 
kind of big. And then if you want to leave also some commands and explanations, it just goes like, <laughs> it, it, it feels like it never finishes or something like that. So I'm not sure what's the best approach there. Is it okay for you guys? Is it, is it, is it rather put it in a, I don't know, poor SQL instance and just, or some, some page being saved there and then just have the link here and, and have the commands, like the explanation and then the, the, the SQL, or maybe we, we do have like the snippets or something like that, store the SQL in a snippet. It's maybe personal preference also. Um, I don't know. I, I think you can also um, collapse larger parts of the comment so that you would be able to put your full query in there and but then collapse it so it doesn't make as, as much noise. Um, I find that quite useful. Um, snippets, not so much. I think it's just distracts from you. You, you have to go somewhere else, um, but it's just my, my personal preference. Okay. What what also helps is when you when queries are formatted by by some kind of standard tool. Um, that's also good. And even even when you compare previous and then the current version of the query, uh, you can even like make a textual diff if the formatting is the same. That that's uh, also kind. Uh, I post the link here, and then I guess I can post it in the document as well, where you can see like. I'm trying to post the SQL and then the query plan and then the new SQL and then the query plan and just this just drags on and on and on and on. And it's like, for me personally, it's kind of, well, when does this stop and when do I read what this guy wants actually, so. Yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, we we can put those plans in the uh, in that tool. You know, there's this explain um, uh -huh, visual the visual mm -hmm. and then you just you know you just link that, and um, it's maybe even a better way to look at the at the plan than textual, and it reduces the noise a little bit because you don't have like big comments. Mara, do you have a different preference for putting queries in snippets or comments? Uh, not really. I mean, um, I think that comment uh, was kind of long, but also very descriptive. So uh, I'm fine with whatever the developer chooses. Hmm. I guess that's a uh, another request for the plan team to make sure you can collapse the uh, how do you call this? The, the uh, uh, when you include some the the code sections within a comment or something like that. That that probably can be very very harmful because sometimes like these kind of code snippets can get long. So then you can shrink them and read the comments and then expand. That would be probably helpful. Oh, that sounds useful. Is this something that we 
could make more visible, like what to do to make those reviews easier. Maybe put that into a documentation page and say, um, and link to that. Yeah, I, I think that will be very helpful. Okay. The, in the documentation that you've just updated recently for the uh, DB review and, and not only for the developers side, when they do ask for review, to, to just ask them to put in the generated SQL rather than for you guys to go into the code and, and, and generate the SQL yourself. You, they, they would provide the SQL and the, the explain plan. So that I guess that will be helpful for the developers as well to know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Should do that. All right, I think we skipped the Rubicop topic. Should we dive into that? Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm just curious about what would be a limit for the text and for the string columns, like if we are going to enforce a particular limit or just ensure that the column has a limit. I think where this came from was just the thinking that um, we should disallow adding columns without a limit because that opens up for abuse or it also means we're not really sure how much data we're probably going to put in there. Um, so just having a Rubicup that would detect that and sort of complain when there is no limit um, would already sort of help to spark a conversation about putting a specific limit in there. Um, I thought about about putting a standard limit in there a bit. Um, first, I thought it was hard because what, what are you going to put in there? Um, but on the other hand, if we made it, if we made a default limit of like 200 characters, um, that would also help. It is aggressive because you don't, you can't put like really a lot of data in there. And when you actually need that, when your use case asks for that, you can you can always say like uh, we allow more than that. Um, or would you rather put a high limit as a default? I think. Go ahead. So, yeah, uh, maybe for this iteration, we should just enforce uh, the limit, like no matter the value, but just enforce like the columns have some limit and take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree because it's hard to know. Sometimes like you can have a title or you can have a URL or you can have a, I don't know, a shidy. So that, that, that the, the, the limit really differs a lot for different cases, but just making sure that the developer or whoever is designing the thing uh, is aware that there needs to be a limit and then they'll have the, the, they'll need to think about it like and impose something and then iterate on that and, and increase it or, or decrease it. Right, we could also add another check that says if you, or that actually limits the amount of, or that caps the limit that you can put in like if you want to put more than 10 megabytes into your text column, that's probably going to be an issue um, anyways. Uh, one issue that I ran against uh, was that if you use a text column and you set a limit, Rails simply ignores the limit value that you set. It does not actually set a limit on the database. Right, I think that's sort of a Postgres side a thing too, uh, because uh, when you want to limit, you will have to use varchar instead of text. I think you can't yeah. put a limit on text for the data type. Which translates to string word in Ruby Rails, right? Right. On the backend for Postgres, there is no no difference between varchar and, and text, so both both work the same apart from the limit. There is very very tiny difference, but like very very tiny difference in implementation, like actually like. And Marchar can have limit, text can, cannot have limit. Is there, yes, yeah. is there another difference than that? No, no, there is. Uh, I remember some small post from Peter Eisenbrout uh, discussing this long time ago. There is very small difference. I can, I can find a link. Because, yeah, that, that would mean we would always use Marchar if we wanted to have a limit, I guess. 
Um, also, uh, should we be concerned oops. about uh, how long it takes to change the limit on a large table? Right. That's the concern that comes with Varjar, right? So when you want to increase that, um, you will have to rewrite the whole table. Although I remember there was some, some trick to that too. Um, I remember reading about something that uh, you can use domains or you can set the limit using a function so that when you want to change it, you don't need to rewrite the whole table. Sorry, that was uh, a wrong paste. Uh, this is what I meant to paste. But uh, like, I'm not sure how difficult it would be to, to write a Rubocop drooling but like even for text fields there must i would say there must be a limit within the ruby code or something like that i don't know maybe maybe the ruby code can just uh, actually people usually ignore warnings <laughs> so unless it's an error then I'm not sure it's worth adding it uh, but yeah because we had recently a security issue on, on a text field, uh, mainly the descriptions and, and the comments. So we, we did limit those, even though it's not possible in uh, Postgre itself, uh, you kind of have to. Oops, I'm chat, link from Peter Eisenhardt. So it has some internal detail, implementation details very short also. Actually, it says that uh, text has some small advantage on the not sure. Do you remember the trick you can use to, to increase or change the limit later for watcher. I remember there was something, but I can't, can't find it. There is also a hacky option to change it. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's not good at all to do this. Production for development, we can do this easily, like, but it's, it's hacky. Like, I think your connection is a bit unstable. Um, was that about changing the, the metadata uh, for the limit? Yes, uh, that this is this is not a good way because it's like a hack. You can do it uh, on development environment only. Right. right. Sorry, I didn't get. Uh, what's not a good way? Nick, do you want to rephrase that, or should I? Yes, uh, so uh, you, we can change uh, limit with ch direct change of system catalog in Postgres. This is uh, like, uh, let's ask how to do it uh, quickly. This is a quick way, but this is not for production, unfortunately. 
And actually, actually I'm, I'm, I'm curious why, why it's not supported to increase the limit without full table scan. It's, I don't remember why. So, I mean, we can directly go to system catalog and uh, say that uh, limit is different. This is just, it can be done with simple update, but this is hack. Maybe this is something we would want to figure out before we put that RuboCop in place so that we have a sort of a suggestion what, what to do, um, how to enforce the limit and that, that we have something that, that works in the end. Just that we're not surprised when with Wartar issues as well. Should, should we uh, at least try to enforce a limit on string columns only, or do we also need to wait? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we would use string anyway, so yeah, adding that limit totally makes sense. Okay. Cool. Um, I see that correctly. Last topic on the agenda about the increasing the number of database maintainers. Mara. Yes. Uh, so I put together some numbers about the database review workload uh, for the last milestone. And uh, I did it because last week, which was officially the last week to ship things for the milestone, it was a bit crazy to get all reviews done because basically my email exploded and my mentions exploded. And I was like, okay, this is not, this is not going to scale very well. Uh, so I just wanted to give an insight of the work that we are doing. Uh, basically, 91 uh, merchant requests were created with database labels. Of those, uh, 56 were merged and 31 were approved by a database uh, maintainer. I think uh, those numbers are not super exact uh, because I built a script uh, with on the API and the API has the limitations. Uh, but what scares me a bit is the average of merge requests that each, that each reviewer has to review, which is 30, and 30 is a lot and the average time it took uh, to approve the database from uh, the merge request from a database perspective, uh, which is eight days. And this is the time that uh, I, I am measuring this time from the moment someone adds the database label until the moment a database maintainer approves, which is not very exact either, but uh, it gives you a good idea. Um, so I don't think or I cannot think on any other way to improve these numbers, to decrease these numbers, other than adding more reviewers. So what do you think? I agree. Um, it's, but it's great seeing those numbers. Uh, it's very useful um, also to see that per release and, and hopefully those, those numbers are going to go down. Um, I was wondering about the about the time to review a bit um, because what we started to do was using those um, scope labels for you know the review itself um, in addition to the database label because um, I would expect there is quite a few MRs out there where you you put a database label from the start but you would only request the review at some point later um, I don't know if it was possible with a with the code you have to consider the scope labels and stuff to make it maybe a bit more accurate. I'm not you aware. To check I'm the time aware. between uh, the review, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, 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 you mean to check the time between, between the label uh, pending review and database approved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is possible to compare uh, what I wanted to do initially is to check the exact time in which the developer asked for a database review. 
but it is not possible with the API because it has the limitations. Like I will need basically to parse all the nodes and try to check for a comment that says more or less like, hey, can, can you do a database review? But mm. not all the, develop, all the developers do that. Most of the developers just assign someone and they don't ask. Um, so it is not possible to be that exact, but maybe with the labels, we could be more exact, maybe. Yeah, I, I didn't know about the label though. I didn't know that you can put on a label to ask for the database review, so. Um, yep. uh, uh, the, the danger bot do, does it for you automatically. You don't need to do it. Uh, well, the danger bot is supposed to do it for you. So what, what should the label be? Database review pending. Hmm. I, don't, I don't have any of those. Uh, the, the change was introduced last week. So if you're okay. merged older than a week, it might not have it. Okay, okay, got it. I had one situation where an MR which didn't touch any database files, uh, the danger bot automatically added the label to that. Well, uh, the database files are not only the ones under the, the DB folder. Uh, I think if you touch either the leaf database folder or some, or even some models, they are going to ask for the database. Uh, I can search like which are the database exactly, the database files. Okay. Okay, I'm going to sign off. I think we are over the time, but today I learned a lot, especially about the uh, database lab. So thanks a lot, a lot, a lot. One more time, Nikolai, and uh, everyone else for the uh, work. And have a nice day. Looking forward for Ooh. feedback. Yeah, I'll give you some feedback, I guess, these days. I'm going to try it out the updates. Hopefully not the top statements, but you never know. Have a nice day. All right, you too. Bye. Right. Bye. Uh, Andreas, if you have a few minutes, I have one question. Sure, should we do that here or somewhere else? Uh, Happy to do both. Uh, depends on the question. <laughs> uh, so on one of uh, my MRs, you commented that uh, about a locking issue. I'll post the link. So my question was, uh, how do we check whether there would be locking issues or no? All right, let me take a quick look so I can remember. Okay, so um, I don't know much about the metrics domain um, and the, the features we have there, but it sounded like we would be when we run that uh, importer for Prometheus metrics, we would um, basically open a transaction and then run maybe a few hundred updates on those metrics. Um, uh, sorry, it's about uh, 22, 22 rows. All right, okay. Um, Okay, so let, let me explain. My, my concern was that when, when you open a tr uh, transaction and then you run updates, you basically um, build up uh, locks as you go until you commit the transaction, right? Um, when that takes a long time, it may become a problem um, for, for other transactions. Um, that was where my concern come from. And that, if that is only like 20 records that we update, um, it's probably not going to be a problem. Okay. But in case it is uh, a few hundred rows, is there any way that we can sort of verify if it would become a problem? It depends a bit on on how this is all implemented. <laughs> in the end. Um, and also how long those updates take. What I've seen the the importer runs um, single record updates. Is that right? So it would it would run would update one record per update query. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It runs one. Um, 
and if those are not heavy then um and they they get the lock immediately then that is going to be quick as well like it, for even for 600 records that's not going to take forever um but if it was a case where the update itself was maybe a calculated one that would take a while um to run then maybe maybe different um but it's it's hard to tell. It was just a general concern to look out for. I think when you when you run single record updates, um, that is sort of the most inefficient way of doing updates, um, and also so takes maybe the most time to do them. Um, and then when you wrap them into a transaction, um, just I would just think about um, what the what the impact of that is. But it's, it really sounds like there is not a problem there. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, the longer the update takes uh, and the larger the number of updates, then we'll have to start worrying about. Yeah, I would think so. Um, on the other hand, it also depends on who's who's using those records, right? Um, if that is sort of a, a highly contended record where everybody's chasing after for okay. updates, for example, then it's, it's a much bigger problem than when you have something that is maybe usually just read only uh, because you know read logs they don't they don't conflict with the write log you can just continue to read it's no problem um so it really really depends on how how that is being used okay so it's a very subjective uh, thing then okay kind of yeah what what's the case here i mean uh, how, how do we use those those records uh those records are used whenever someone goes to the um, metrics dashboard. So each of those gets pulled into a chart on the dashboard. So I guess every time someone opens that page. But that sounds like a like a select or you know read on on that record, right? Um, yeah, it's mostly a read. Yeah, the only write is through the importer. Okay, I mean in that case you're you're totally safe because. Um, you know those reads; they would continue to work even even when you take ages to to update the the, the record, um, right? Because they don't they don't conflict with that lock, so you would you would get it immediately. Um, so it so sounds like there's absolutely no problem here. Okay, I don't know. Thanks for the info. Cool. I'll try to capture that on the comment after the call. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right, we're way over time. Uh, should we wrap it up? Yeah, sorry about that. No, no problem at all. Um, cool. Well, it was great having all those topics on the agenda today. Um, great having that. Thank you for that. <laughs> and yeah, have a nice have a nice day and uh, see you next time. Talk to you Bye. soon.